Hello and welcome as ever to the Penguin Podcast, the place where leading authors reveal how they unlock their creative process. Now, my name is Nihal Arthanaika. I'm joined by the author of 11 novels for adults, five for younger readers, and his book, The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas, cast him into the literary spotlight and was made into a feature film, award-winning no less. He's here to talk about his latest book for young adults, which is called My Brother's Name is Jessica, and his name is John Boyne. Hello, John. Hello. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Good. It is regular in the parish you now find yourself that authors bring along a handful of objects that have inspired their work. John has kindly brought along a football. He can do one keepy uppy, I believe. Which in is, a row. In a row. Yeah. In a row. Which not, is not just the one. No, it's not in a row. <laughs> Uh, we also have a locked black box. Mm, interesting. Locked, not for long, I hope. A copy of one of his books, and we will sum up a collection of uh, messages, advice that he has. I guess the uh, the Ten Commandments that he has etched into his own stone tablet that uh, will provide advice for those of you listening who wish to be authors themselves. But before we get into our objects, it would be remiss of me not to ask you to give us a synopsis of my brother's name is Jessica, John. Well, it's a novel narrated by a 13-year-old boy, Sam, who has spent his life so far being inspired by, looking up to his older brother, who has been a wonderful older brother. And uh, he's the most popular footballer in school. Uh, the girls love him. And um, at the end of the first chapter, uh, this sibling comes downstairs and tells his parents and tells Sam that he doesn't think he's a boy. He feels he's actually a girl. So the novel takes place really over a summer where Sam and his family, but mostly Sam, have to explore this subject, have to come to terms with it, have to help Jessica, which they don't do very well for the most part of the book. Sam is confused. He's baffled by it. He's embarrassed by it. He's bullied because of it in school. He doesn't show Jessica um, the love and support that she's shown him through his entire life. So it's it's a book about empathy, I suppose. It's a book about like showing a boy going on a journey from a place of ignorance and um, a little bit of prejudice to recognising that his sister is the same person she always was, just with a new name, a new gender identity, a, a changing body, but everything in her mind, all her, her kindness, her love, it's all the same. Why Sam, as the narrator, and not the object of the book, Jessica. I felt that if I wrote the novel from the perspective of Jessica and put myself as an author and as a narrator through the emotional experience of gender confusion and coming out as trans, I would probably and just justifiably be accused of a form of cultural appropriation, really. That's not my story to tell. A trans person can write that story a thousand times better than I can. The story I can tell is about a person who doesn't really know very much about the subject at the start. Now, I would have known more than Sam does. I'm, I'm not 13. But the person who doesn't know that much is a little confused by it, is asking questions, the kind of questions we have when we are talking about this subject, things that we just, we may phrase them insensitively. We may ask questions that are stupid at times, but it's all part of our learning curve on it. So in my young people's books, I've always kind of placed children in the centre of a, a very adult situation that they do not understand, but that they have to cope with and ask those questions. So it just felt right to me that he would represent me. He would also represent the reader. I would assume that the majority of young people reading this book do not know very many trans people, if any at all, but they may be getting to a stage in their life where some of their friends will be experiencing gender identity issues or where they themselves might be feeling gender identity issues. And through his voice, I'm hoping they will realise that there, there are people out there who are their allies, who are not judgmental, who will help them, that as difficult as this is, actually, it can also be very freeing. Before Jessica transitions, um, it's interesting that Jessica was a boy's boy. And that's why your first object, football, is important, because Jessica was the captain of the football team as Sam's brother. Why that detail? I wanted to make it clear that uh, anybody can be transgender, just like anybody can be gay. It's not something that 
is a learned habit or something. It's not something... Or that, lifestyle choice. Or know. lifestyle choice. Yeah. It's nothing like that. It's got nothing to do with how you were brought up. It's simply the way that you were born. So we might expect a lot of the time that a transgender person or a character in a novel who is a transgender person is going to start out as being perhaps if it's like from boy to girl, maybe being a rather effeminate boy. I wanted to show, actually, it's not the case. It can be anybody. So we've got the best footballer in the school. Also, the guy who all the girls like. He's basically your almost stereotypical boy, great boy's boy, you know. He's a, he's a jock in the American yeah, context. Yeah, yeah, like, like he's everybody's best friend. And his story from who he was as a boy to her story when he transitions and he comes out and he expresses his his true authentic self. It can be that person just as much as it can be anybody else. Did the writing of this book, John, reveal to you any of the stereotypes you may have held? Look, hasn't everybody probably done that in some way? You know, it's 100%. just, it's human nature, you know? Yeah. And one of the things, I, when I was writing the book, uh, my publisher, Puffin, had put me in touch with a group called Inclusive Minds, an organisation in the UK that work with publishers and writers on books that have topics for young readers that could be contentious in some way. And they appoint what they call an ambassador for a book, where it's somebody who's actually gone through the experience and obviously knows then, you know, a million times more than I do. And that person then reads whatever, how many drafts you want to give them. You make contact with them, you talk about it. And the first things I heard were just the factual things that I got wrong, you know, things about, you know, maybe hormones or what you take, what you don't take or how you feel uh, when you take those drugs or whatever. Then the second thing would be where you are maybe just going too far with a joke or where it's becoming a little bit insensitive as a, as a book rather than a character. So kind of pulling back from things. But but also the, one of the most important things I was told, and I ended up incorporating this into the novel because of, uh, I've been told this, was one of the first things I think about, for right or wrong, when it's a, a male to female transition, is basically genitalia, you know, and surgery. And what's, what's happening there? You know, I have a friend who uh, is a has gone from, you know, a male to female transition. And I did, in fact, once ask her mother um, that question, you know, and the mother gave me an answer, but I could see she was looking a bit uncomfortable. And I said, you know, I said, is that, I guess I'm not supposed to ask that, right? And she said, no, no, you're you're really not. And this is why. But I, I subsequently heard it from the inclusion ambassador that Sam in the book just goes on and on and on about the fact that his sibling cannot be a girl because she has a penis, and he this to to him is the is the only important thing. And what the ambassador told me was that you know it's actually got nothing to do with that. It's really about what's happening in your mind. Everybody thinks it's all about that, but it's one of the smallest things. Um, if for want of a better for description, yes. it. it's, it's like uh, one of the least important aspects of this, really. So I, I use that in the book where, you know, when Jessica, who has been very accommodating towards Sam in his commentary yeah, along the way, brings this up once again, she basically explodes at him and says, you know, enough, enough with this. This is if this is the only thing that you are interested in, then, you know, there's something wrong here. And, and I thought before writing the book, I would have thought that was right at the heart of things. But actually, from what I'm told and what I understand and believe, then it's it certainly becomes an issue at some point. But it is not the, the primary thing. Actually, the primary thing is being able to say it, is being able to say out loud, I'm trans. That is the first thing. And then, Which happens early on in the book for the, for the right reasons. Yeah, it happens right reasons. there in the first chapter. Yeah. And the minute somebody says that, just like, you know, for me, the first time, you know, I said to somebody that I'm gay, it's... It's out there. It's off your shoulders. You cannot take it back. But the minute you admit it to another person, it becomes real. And I can remember for myself the moment that I did that. The next morning, like going to bed that night thinking, I'll wake up the next morning with, you know, the fear. (laughs) You know, what have I done? And I can remember waking up the next morning and feeling free. Feeling so liberated. I'd only told one person, but I just felt so free because now I had started it and there'd be no going back. And I felt really good about it. And I think it's the same for trans people, I suspect, that firstly, it's that. Then it's about, I think, how you present yourself to the world. Being able to to dress, to look the way that makes you feel comfortable. The next thing for a trans person is that it's being able to present 
an image to the world, to the mirror of the person they, they know they are inside. And everything else is, you know, down the line. As you said in the first chapter, you get that admission out. But there is still a lot of kind of concealment, the things that are hidden away. And, and that's why I think this locked black box is quite symbolic of, uh, yes. of what goes on in families. Oh, it's, uh, there you go, yeah, there you go, go. open it up. So what, what, what do you, what do you uh, have in there? Well, this is also, you know, used in the book where uh, there's the, the things that Jessica keeps in her, as most teenage boys will have, you know, a private collection of magazines. Well, it did in my day. Yeah. And Sam has discovered these. But it's one of the confusions for him and it's one of the confusions for Jessica in the book that Jessica in her previous incarnation, so to speak, in her, in her life growing up so far as a boy originally, fancies girls. He's into girls. You know, he's not gay, uh, which again is a preconception that a lot of people will have about a trans person, that you are, you're gay. And actually, they're not necessarily. And um, in his little collection of magazines, they're they're girly magazines, you know, they're pictures of naked girls. And Sam knows where all these are hidden and he's 13 and he roots them out and, you know, looks at them himself. And Like a bloodhound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's one of the things that he then confronts Jessica on. He says, you say you're not gay, but you're, you're looking at these. And if you think you're a girl, then if you're still attracted to girls, doesn't mean that, doesn't that mean you're gay? Doesn't that mean you're a gay girl? And Jessica at that point is like, you know, look, I don't know. I'm 17. I'm figuring this out. It's so complicated to get those, all those labels and terms and figure out, you know, what am I supposed to be calling myself here? You know, what's, mm. what's the right terminology? Um, it, it just becomes baffling to them. So I brought the box to sort of to, to be the, like where she keeps those magazines, but we're on also we're like keeping all those secrets and that even taking them out, it doesn't make it all necessarily immediately easy and answers are all there. It, they're not. It's, it's, it's very complicated. We're all complicated. You and I have spoke before. You said when your own coming out story is a relatively smooth one. What were the unforeseen questions? I think people asked me, like my parents and stuff would say to me, but, you know, you've had, you've had girlfriends and stuff. And, um, you know, because I had loads of girlfriends easily growing up. You know, you get to 16, 17, 18. You do what everyone else is doing. I look back and I never think that I was being deceitful or anything like that. I think I was a teenager trying to figure everything out. I I knew I was gay, but I wasn't yet ready to to absolutely confirm that to either to the world or myself for absolute certain. I wanted to try it out at least and see what it would be like and it, it Try before you buy. It didn't take, shall we say. And <laughs> posters on the wall of Kylie and Jason, but it wasn't really for Kylie's sake. And um so you get asked that, that people assume that just because you might have done something once doesn't mean yeah. that, that, you know, that's the case. Uh, was there any, well, duh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was. Certainly from my, my siblings, there were. Um, my older brother and older sister did not fall off the chair in <laughs> absolute astonishment, shall we say. Not to stereotype, but hey, I can stereotype myself, right? Yeah, of course, course you can. Of course you can. You know, my music taste... Um, my bedroom, everything was my posters on the wall. The cat was out of the bag, I would have thought, <laughs> if, you, if you had any brain in your head. I want to move on, actually, to your next object, uh, which is a copy of one of your own books. Yes. And it is The Boy in the Striped Pyjamas. Right. You said you, you see no difference writing for adults as you do writing for younger people. Why? Well, mo mostly no different. Firstly, with, in terms of that, you know, the, what we're talking about a lot here is life changing moments, you know, and my big life changing moment really was Boy in the Striped Pajamas, you know, the, the, when I finished writing that, which was my fifth book. And the first four, you know, had they, they'd been published, but they hadn't done particularly well. And then this book came along that suddenly exploded. And my life completely changed um, almost overnight. And in what way? Firstly, you know, it's going to sound maybe trivial in a way, but firstly, I had a few quid in the bank and I'd never had any money. You know, I've been flat broke, <laughs> you know, for years. What was the first thing and, you bought? So um, I love this question. The, the, the first Vespa. thing you bought. You bought a Vespa? Yeah, I bought a, I bought a bike. I'd never had, I didn't have a car because I couldn't drive. I took the bike lesson and I bought uh, a little Vespa 
and I've loved Vespers ever since. Like yeah. a classic Italian nineteen. Well, yeah, no, it wasn't a vintage one. It was it like it was a it was a like whatever year it was. And it was great to have that mode of transport at last and uh, not to be always relying on buses. So I bought myself a bike, but it was also just the, with that book, it was sold in like 50 odd countries. And suddenly over over a couple of weeks, every time I would check my, my email, there'd be another one from my foreign rights agent saying, we've now sold it in Germany and Italy and Brazil and wherever for this much. And suddenly as a writer, I started to see the potential freedom that was in front of me that actually... Most writers are not fortunate enough to be able to make a living out of it or to be able to do it full time. They have to supplement their income in some way. And if you can focus on anything full time, you're probably going to get a little bit better at it, you know. So suddenly I saw I've got an opportunity here to really get a foundation here for my life. I can not work in anything other than writing. I can just write my novels, write the very best ones I could write. I would end up, you know, traveling so much to festivals and so on. It gave me a lot of freedom. In terms of writing for adults and writing for young people, there's no difference in the way that I approach a novel, the way I plan it, structure it, whatever. Um, I don't make the language any simpler in children's books. I, I just write the same way I would with anything else. And I don't make the themes any simpler. The six books I've written for young people, three of them are in wartime settings. One is about the death of a parent. One is about a child who is abandoned by his parents for being different. And um, then in this one, a transgender character. I trust my young readers, not only that they are able to read such serious books, but that they want to read them, that they want to be challenged. When a book is made into a film, what is that like for you? I mean, are you good at letting go of something that you've created? One of the, the great sort of like lies about film adaptations in a way is when somebody says, oh, I saw the film of such and such a book. Oh, my God, they destroyed the book. Actually, nothing has happened to the book. The book is exactly the same as it always was. They could make a film that was hundred times better than the original novel or a hundred times worse. It doesn't change the original novel. It's still there. And I knew going into the process that uh, if they made a terrible film, everybody would say, well, it's not as good as the book. And if they made a brilliant film, it would only enhance the reputation of the book. So Win, uh, win. Well, kind of, yeah, yeah. You know, and it keeps the book in people's minds. It keeps it in bookshops. You get the film tie-in jackets, all that. So, And by the time... Um, the film adaptation of Stripey Jams came out. I remember being on the movie tour, because it's unusual, but they took me on the tour around the States with the, the actors and the director. And um, every American journalist would say to me in the interviews, this must be the most exciting thing that's ever happened to you in your life. And I would go, ah, well, no, it's not actually. <laughs> right. uh, it really isn't. You know, the most, like, publishing the book in the first place and other books have were very exciting. And you know, I've had the occasional exciting moment in my own personal life and this is nice, but they want you to say this is the pinnacle of it. Please tell me that you've seen the clip online of Robert Smith from The Cure at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I saw it like about two weeks ago yes. or something. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly that, isn't it? Where the presenter's like, oh my God, you're here. This is amazing. You're a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, The Cure. I mean, are you excited as I am? Yeah. By the sounds of it, no. That's what he says to <laughs> <laughs> and you've that's, just reminded me. Yeah, basically, that's you pretty said much that it. to all you know, of those journalists. It was it, it was constant, every single one. And they, <laughs> but it's that's people who don't really understand books in a way that they think the book's ah, fine, yes. but it's only a, it's only a good book if it got made into a movie, and that's what gives it it's some sort of in that case the validation. And that is not what an author thinks. You know, the well, book that, is the book. Well, that's my next question. I guess as someone who is a creative. For some creatives, there is this, to use a, a term that I remember from A-level economics, vertical integration. So you will say, I'm a creative and I write a book. Vertical integration means that the book I made into a film, OK, and I want to write the screenplay and maybe I want to direct. Oh, and then actually I want to direct the film. And actually then I want a franchise of the films. And then I want to make. So there's that. That shows a certain type of ambition in a yeah. very commercial sense. As an author... What is your ambition? It, it doesn't lie in that direction. I have tried uh, many years ago now, I've, I tried writing a screenplay. I'm not good at it. I can't do it uh, any more than I could write a poem. I remember writing a screenplay once and giving it to my film agent. Uh, when I went in to see him, the first thing he said to me, he looked at me and he said, you have actually seen a film, haven't you? You know. <laughs> And I thought, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, wow. Yeah. That's passive aggressive. <laughs> it is. You know, and, um, and 
also it doesn't really I don't know it just doesn't interest me that much I love movies I love going to the movies but yeah. um, what is my ambition I'm actually exactly in my life where I want to be I was ambitious to get to this point to be able to have the freedom to write the books I want to write without any real interference in it and I, I'm fortunate enough that I have reached that point I'm not always looking for the next thing to win on sort of mm. I'm actually very content with my life to continue for the rest of my life exactly as it is right now. What an amazing place to be in, to, to coin a popular phrase. You're living your best life uh, right now. I'd like someone to share it with. Yeah, that okay, nice. okay. Well, that's, you know. I mean, you know, it's not that kind of podcast. We're not uh, dating. Okay. This is not a dating podcast. My publicist's email is on my website. I'm really <laughs> to, to get in touch. <laughs> You're a handsome man. You should definitely Thank be able you. to sort that out. I do have out. a face for radio. No, yeah, you do not. So. You're a handsome man. That's interesting because um, writing is such a solitary craft, isn't yeah. it? So when you come out of that self-imposed cocoon of literary creation, do you go crazy? In real life, sort of, I'm actually very solitary. And my favourite place to be is at home. I don't go to parties, really. I don't go to book launches. I really don't enjoy being out socialising very much. I'm, I'm just not that sort of person. The one thing I do enjoy, I love being on, say, a stage at a literary festival and talking to readers. You know, and here we are talking, talking to readers. I love talking about books. That gets me really excited and enthusiastic. I enjoy the events when I'm doing them, but once they're done, I'm happy to just go home. We want to listen to some of the book now. My brother's name is Jessica. This is the issue where gender comes up in a classroom in Sam's history lesson whilst discussing Elizabeth I. This is where the class brings up Jessica, formerly known, of course, as Jason. Elizabeth decided that she would never marry. She saw herself as neither king nor queen, but simply as sovereign, neither man nor woman, completely without gender. A bit like Jason Waver said David Fugue, out of the blue. And I looked up, not entirely sure that I'd heard him right. Uh, what was that, David? asked Mr Lowry, looking at him with a baffled expression on his face. I said, she sounds a bit like Jason Waver, sir. Sam's brother. Neither man nor woman. Completely without gender. The entire class turned to look at me in confusion, and I felt my heart start to beat faster inside my chest as my face grew red. My invisibility was starting to fade. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, said Mr Lowry, shaking his head. I'm talking about Queen Elizabeth I, and you're talking about... Oh, haven't you heard, sir? asked David, grinning like the cat who'd got the cream. It turns out that Sam's brother has decided that he wants to be a girl. Everyone was turning to each other now, mouths open in amazement. Not entirely certain what was happening, but sure that there must be some reason for it. A great scandal about to unfold. That was My Brother's Name is Jessica, read brilliantly by Joe Jameson, who had all our eyebrows going up at the uh, opening of that. Uh, written, of course by my guest, John Boyne. Oh, David, he was annoying, wasn't he? <laughs> the nemesis. With that character, yeah, his nemesis. And what a nemesis he is. But also as well kind of articulates just that cruelty. Do you enjoy writing that, a kind of bad character? So an actor's say as well, playing someone kind of evil and someone who's uh, there just to wind everybody up. I think you can enjoy writing a villain. I don't think you enjoy writing cruelty, necessarily. That's right. Okay. But in the case of David, when he's first introduced in the book, we know already that he himself is going through something in his own life that is upsetting him. And usually bullies are like that. You know, usually bullies want to take the attention off their own pain, whatever they're going through, by taking it out on the weaker person. But it's not fun writing mean lines but you have to throw some mean lines in there to make it authentic to to shock the reader you know if a 12 year old reads this and comes across some of the mean things that are said and thinks that's really horrible well maybe it will make them think about saying those kind of things themselves yes i'm envious 
of where you find yourself in life right now, apart from the single bit, obviously. And you clearly are not an author that believes that there's a negative energy that you need to be able to harness to to create. I'm not one of those kind of pretentious people, I think, that, uh, you know, says that the artist is tortured tortured and all that. Actually, you don't have to be tortured. You can be having a perfectly nice life. But I've always found that writing kind of saves me through things. Like, for example, you know, about... uh, Two and a half years ago, I did a relationship I was in for 11 years came to an end and we were in a civil partnership and so that we had to go through the dissolution and it wasn't something I had wanted to happen. But through that, I still wrote all the time. I could be, you know, feeling miserable. I could be crying or something, but like then it would be time to go to work and sit down and like, I'd forget about it and be back on the pages. And it wasn't that the pain was making me write because I was always writing anyway. It's that the, the writing was just keeping me alive in the world, really. And if I hadn't had the writing, I don't know really know what would have become of me. But was the writing around that period at all infused with the pain that you were feeling or was it actually an antidote to the pain you were feeling? So it managed to then compartmentalise the emotions. I'm not sure, to be honest. I know that the book that I wrote during that time, A Ladder to the Sky, features my most sociopathic character. So maybe that says something. Um, But then I also wrote this during it, um, which, for all its seriousness, um, also has a lot of jokes in it and is full of humour. I would never have abandoned the writing at all. It saved me a lot. Your last object is perhaps something that can save other authors out there. You've made your own Ten Commandments, which I hope you do get somehow... um if you know a good carpenter, etched into your (laughs) stairs or something. We won't go through all ten of them for obvious reasons. But But I'll just say one thing about them before before you mention them, is that every writer finds their own way to work, you know, and there are no rules. You find what works for you and you stick with it. These points are things that work for me. They might not necessarily work for other people, but they're, they're just things that I find helpful. Okay, what do we have? Let's start with number one. Yeah. Number one is like not believing in a muse, that like not saying I'm not going to wait until the muse arrives. Writing is about discipline and about focus. It's about sitting down and writing, if you can, every day of the week, putting down another paragraph, putting down another page. If you wait for inspiration, it's probably never going to come. But if you sit down, you put down a sentence, that sentence can lead you to another one and another one. And before you know it, it could open a floodgate. Maybe you'll only get a paragraph, but you might get a few pages, you might get 10 pages. But if you're just waiting for it to come, Look, it's never going to come. Is that then sometimes the muse is basically a way of prevaricating? So you can say, well, I need to wait for the muse. It will actually, no, you just need to get Yeah, on I mean, you can be it. kidding yourself. You know, you can be lying to yourself that you're, you're waiting. It's also a way of, I think, putting yourself on a pedestal a little bit <laughs> and saying, you know, I'm so, I'm, you know, what if everybody else said, you know, if, if you got up to go to work and I'm, saying, I'm so sorry, the muse didn't come. I, I will not be... Um, you know, driving the tube today or... Yeah. Uh, you I can't know, be an accountant doing today. The, yeah, I can't. I didn't yeah, get the news. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stay home and watch Good Morning Britain or something, you know. Um, it's... Uh, actually, the, it, it could be quite an interesting world if people did that, now that I say it. <laughs> yeah, so, imagine in every discipline. Yeah. We started with one. Let's end with ten then. Okay. Advice, ten out of ten. And this is a good one. Oh, yeah. This says that writing is a joy. You know, it is so much fun and you should enjoy writing it. Do not be one of those writers who says, I hate it. It's a chore. I wish I didn't have to do it. It's like blood being pulled from me. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. You know, the, the, the world is not going to fall apart if you do not deliver your next novel. It's, it'll, it'll keep turning. You know, I don't care who you are. But if you are enjoying the writing, the reader will enjoy the reading of it. You know, if you are so lost, if you're having great fun with it, no matter how dark the story is, if you're coming away from your writing every day feeling, oh, just I'm so enthused by this, that enthusiasm will come across on the page itself. And the the other part of this is that, you know, I've worked with editors in 50 something countries, you know, and everywhere I go, every festival I do, every editor I meet, Every publisher is looking for great books. The reason they're in that job in the first place is because they've been reading all their lives. Yes, they want to sell a few books and make a bit of money out of them, but I have never known an editor who will turn down a a brilliant book because they don't think it will sell. They are looking for them. So you have to believe that good writing will find its audience. You have to believe that. And even though sometimes you might walk into a bookshop and see books that you think are rubbish or celebrity books or whatever. A lot of those books pay for the good books, you know, in real life. You have to believe that the good writing will find its way out. And if you don't believe that, 
then there's no point bothering. Are you not always reading now as opposed to writing to find out where your next tattoo is going to come from? <laughs> um, well, yes, I have two tattoos, but actually one is not about books. One is for my favourite singer and one is for my favourite book. I've seen John Irving. Yeah, the book uh, is We Are All Terminal Cases, which is the last line of in the word uh, of the word according to Garp. It says, in the word according to Garp, we are all terminal cases on my left arm. And on my right arm, it says wave after wave, which is a line from um, Hounds of Love by Kate Bush at the back of the Hounds of Love album. I've been a Kate Bush obsessive since I was 12. I am one of those like total Kate Bush people. Remember when she did those shows a few years back? I think it was in 2015 yes. in London. And I got tickets for the opening night show and I was in the second row. She went down through the audience and out the door. But then she came back in and wandered through the audience. And as she passed me, you know, I held my hands up, you know, high five. And she high fived me. It's the most exciting moment of my life. Um, so I got this tattoo after that. It was my first tattoo because I just thought, you know, I wanted to kind of commemorate it. Superb. So if Kate Bush is listening, I love you, Kate. And please call me. <laughs> and... What's next? I know we're here. We've talked stalking Kate Bush. Length. Yes, apart from so. stalking Kate Bush, which I'm sure she's her lawyers are already all yes, over. Um, my brother's name is Jessica, of course, and that's ostensibly why we've been having this conversation. What have you got going around in your head? Well, I'm working. I've been working on a new book for the last um, year or so. I move between the adult books and the young adult books, so I'm working on a, an adult book at the moment. I'm on a, a third draft of it. It's a big historical epic. There's no actual, there's no controversial element to it all. It's a big story. I'm working on that and all going well, that will come out at some point next year. John Boyne, you absolute star. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. That was fun. Yeah, that was. That really was. Just a reminder that if you haven't already done so, do subscribe to the Penguin Podcast using any of the podcatchers such as uh, iTunes, Acast or Spotify on your desktop or smartphone. We're also available on your Alexa-enabled device. And if you like what you hear, please do share, rate and review the Penguin podcast. We'd love to know what you think. 1826, and all of London is in a frenzy. Crowds gather at the gates of the Old Bailey to watch as Franny Langton, maid to Mr and Mrs Benham, goes on trial for their murder. The testimonies against her are damning. Slave, whore, seductress. And they may be the truth but they are not the whole truth. Their past is as little known to them as their future. They are machines that must be rewound when everyone wants to make them move. Charlevoix. One word frees us of all the weight and pain of life. That word is love. Sophocles. The Old Bailey, London, 7th of April, 1826. I never would have done what they say I've done to Madame, because I loved her. Yet they say I must be put to death for it, and they want me to confess. But how can I confess what I don't believe I've done? The Confessions of Franny Langton is a dazzling debut by Sarah Collins, about one woman's fight to tell her story. It leads you through laudanum laced dressing rooms and dark as night back alleys into the enthralling heart of Georgian London. The audiobook is available to download now.